Welcome to the Triangle Microworks IEC 60870-5 Communication Protocol Training Videos. This video is part two in the series. In part one, we provided an overview of the IEC 60870-5 protocol, talked about stack layers and the application layer. In this video, we're gonna dive into more detail on the ASDU structure. All right, I've mentioned ASDU several times already. Um, ASDU is an application service data unit and it's a concept that's used at the application layer. The ASDU always includes the type of data which is contained, the number of data objects in that unit, and the addressing for those data objects, the cause of transmission, or basically why the data is being sent, and the data objects themselves. These ASDUs are defined in the standard, and they're built up with several different base types, so there are several standard ones that are defined. The spec also leaves open the possibility of creating custom ASDUs. Of course, for interoperability, that could be a limiting factor unless both sides recognize the same custom ASDUs. And finally, note that 101 and 104 do have a different set of standard ASDUs. They are basically the same, uh, with the biggest difference being in the time tags, uh, where the format for those are different. So if you look at how the ASDU is put together, there's always a data unit identifier. Um, this identifies what type the ASDU is. Um, basically, it describes the format of the data, what's included, and the basic types of data that are included in the message. It also has the VSQ, or Variable Structure Qualifier, which identifies how many objects are in the ASDU. You can have the cause of transmission, which is why the ASDU is being sent. There are several different cause of transmissions, and the cause is different depending on whether this is a control, or a pull, or a read. And then there's the common address for the ASDU. This can identify the address for the station or the logical sector. And like I said before, 60870-5 allows you to have multiple sectors for a single outstation. Also, this common address allows you to uniquely identify every piece of data in the entire system because every sector has to have a different common address. So it's a way of basically taking the DNP three-point numbering scheme but instead expanding that to the entire system so that each point, not only do you have a point number, but you also have this common address which uniquely identifies each sector. So that's the header with the data unit identifier in it. Then there's the information objects of which there can be multiple or there can be just a single information object. The structure of the information objects is based on the type identification. It will always include the information object address and always include at least one information element and it can include a time tag. There are several different ways these can be put together, just like there are several different ways an ASDU can be put together. So we have some examples in just a little bit to kind of clarify what different options are available. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through the ASDU structure in a little bit more detail. The type ID is the first octet in the ASDU. There are up to 127 different ASDU types. They're basically grouped into different sections here. So you have the status and the measured values, these are basically all the different data types which can be included. You have commands for identifying what type of command request is being sent for the master, and you have the new security types which are added for the secure authentication part of the standard. And then you also have commands for control, commands for monitoring, but these are things like interrogation and reading objects versus commands for control or setting outputs or binary outputs and set points. And then there's commands for measured values and file transfer related commands. So several different types of commands. Here are just a few examples. You have single point with or without time, double point with or without time. You have a single point command, a double point command, a read command, uh, clock synchronization. Uh, if you compare this to DNP3, it's roughly similar to the different object groups and variations, except it's fixed. Uh, with DNP, the master can request a specific object group or data type and a specific variation of that data. With 60870-5, it's fixed. The master cannot request different variations other than to request a specific type identification, and then it gets the variation that's defined with that type. All right, moving on, the second octet in the ASTU is the variable structure qualifier. Basically, this is telling you how many elements are in the ASTU. Now, there is an option to have a sequence ASDU. And so if it's a sequence, it's basically the address is gonna tell you what the starting element is, and then the, this number is gonna tell you how many elements from that starting point you're going to include in the ASDU. If it's not sequenced, then the number here is really how many objects you have, and each one is gonna have its own address. 
If you read the standard, it tells you ASDU by ASDU whether or not it supports sequence data. And so it's kind of a complicated concept, but once you look at the ASDUs, it's very clear why this is in here and how the ASDU is structured. Moving on to the third octet is the cause of transmission. This is a very important concept because basically I would say it replaces several different concepts in DNP3. There are 47 different cause of transmissions. So let's skip up to look at some of the cause of transmissions. Um, basically, cause of transmission identifies why the data are being sent. These are really for different types of requests and responses. So when an ASDU is sent, it'll include the cause of transmission. So for example, if you're doing some sort of polling in which the outstation is sending to the master, you can identify if this data is a cyclic measurement that's being taken or if it's really event data that's being sent. Then we move on to controls where the cause of transmission can tell if this is an initial activation or if it's a confirmation that's being sent back for the original activation or if the activation is being terminated or the command's being terminated. If the master requests something that the outstation doesn't have, the outstation could say this is an unknown address or an unknown object. So there's really no equivalent to this in DNP3 except for maybe some of the IIN bits. Uh, the cause of transmission is an option for each ASDU, but the standard does define which cause of transmission can be used for each of the ASDUs. So for a particular ASDU, there may only be just a few causes which can actually be used. Once again, if you look through the standard, it's much clearer when you look at each particular ASDU as it clearly shows what's supported and what's not supported. All right, so that's basically the cause which is included. There's also some other bits here, so you can put the ASDU in the test mode, or you can have a positive or negative confirmation for a request. There's also an option to include the address for the station which originated the request, but this isn't very commonly used. All right, so the last part of the ASDU header is the common address. Like I was explaining before, each physical outstation can have multiple sectors, and so there are several different ways you can do the addressing. If you have just one station in one sector, then your ASDU common address really is the station's address. If you want to set up multiple logical sectors for one outstation, then you can have a common address for each of those sectors. That allows you to expand your addressing space, and it also allows you to segment different objects into different sectors. The spec really goes into a lot of details about the different topologies that this allows. I won't go into that because there's a lot of different complicated factors there. Uh, but the common address can be one or two octets, but that's fixed across the entire system. So if you need a large addressing space, you can make this two octets. There's also a concept of a broadcast address. So if you want to send a command to all of the stations at once, then you can set the address to FF if you're using one octet addressing or FFFF if you're using two octet addressing. And then that request will be seen by all of the outstations and they all know they need to process this command. The complete addressing for the system will use that common address that I was just talking about and the information object address or IOA. For example, if you had two different stations, one station could have just one sector and the other station could have multiple sectors. So each of these sectors has a common address and then each of the elements has an IOA or information object address. So between the combination of the common address and the IOA, you have a distinct address for every object in the system. That's different from DNP3 in which the address number is reused for each data type. So in DNP, the uniqueness of addressing comes from data type and index number, whereas in 608.70-5, it's based on the common address and the IOA. The final piece in the ASDU is the information objects. There are three different ways you can put together the information objects as shown here. There's a single information element, and that's basically when you have just a single information element which has just one address for that element, and you can have a sequence of these included in the ASDU. So you could have multiple of these single information elements, and that's this third type over here, or you can have a combination of information elements where they're a different format and there are multiple elements. This is to accommodate things like having a single point status with a timestamp. Those are technically different information element formats, and then they're put together to form this information object. So it's kind of getting into the weeds of the terminology and the standard, but basically I wanted to outline how you can put together different elements into objects. The single information element could look like a single command or event. Uh, this combination of elements, like I said before, is like a data value with a quality or a time included. And then a sequence is when you have a whole series of measured values. So you can basically just say this is the starting address for this series and how many of them are going to be included. 
And when you look through the different ASTUs in the spec, it basically tells you which of these are supported for the different types. At the lowest level in this whole structure of information objects is what they call the information element. This is put together using just these four basic types. So you have a Boolean, an integer, a real number, or a bit string. It can also include a quality descriptor, which is usually just a few bits that are used for quality. It's important to point out that time is not included in this. There's several different information elements for time specifically, so time is not part of the single point status or part of an analog value. It's its own information element, which is put together with other information elements to create an object. I'll get to a couple of examples that I think will clarify this in just a second, but basically there's 40 different information elements which are specified in the standard. So just a few examples, there's a single point with quality. Now you can have a quality descriptor, which has lots of different bits for setting quality, versus the single point with quality, which just uses a couple of bits. There's also a short floating point number, a binary counter, a single command, which we put together in an information element, or there's several different types of time which are defined. This is kind of equivalent to data type variations in DNP3, but once again, there's fixed, and so the master cannot request a certain variation. It's just defined that way, and that's how it would all be used. A very simple example of an information element is the single point with quality. This basically has these five bits in it, so it has a single point status, a bit for blocking so that the previous value stays there, it has a bit for substitution so you can override the value, it has topical or not topical to tell whether the value has been updated or not. This would typically be used in, say, a data concentrator, which is receiving data from downstream. And then there's a valid or invalid quality bit. So this is just one of the 40 different information elements. So as an example, let's put together an ASTU for a single point information for the time tag. So you include that single point with quality, with a three octet binary time, and the address for that object. That's the information object when you put those three things together. The data unit identifier will identify the type as being a type two. The VSQ will tell you that it's not a sequence ASTU and it has, in this example, two octets. It could be one object or there could be up to 127 objects in this ASTU. It'll tell you the cause of transmission. If this was a cyclic measurement from the outstation, the outstation would identify this as a cause of transmission of one. And then it has a common address for the ASTUs and that's the address for the sector. In this example, we've got two of these information objects. Like I said, you could have up to 127 in one single ASDU. So here's another example, this time for a command. This is a single command, and so basically it tells you the command state and then the qualifier for the command. The qualifier includes the operation for the command. So this is kind of like DNP3, where you have pulse on, latch on, or those types of modes. In 608.70-5, you have short pulse, long pulse, or persistent. Uh, persistent, obviously, it's going to set it, and that's going to remain until it's changed by another command. Whereas the pulse, the short pulse and long pulse, pulse the output for a predefined period of time, unlike DNP3, in which you can actually specify the length of a pulse in the command. In 608.70-5, there's a configuration option for the length of a short pulse and a long pulse, and you simply say short pulse or long pulse. It also has an indicator whether this is the select or the execute for the command, and that's basically all that's included in that single command element, or SCL. So when you put together the ASDU for the single command, if we look at the information object, there's only one for a command, and it includes the address for the object which is being controlled. Then it has the SCO, or single command element, included. And then in the data unit identifier, it'll have the type ID set to 45, which is the number for a single command. It also has a zero for the sequence, because it's not a sequence measurement, and it says that there's only one object. When you're starting a command, the cause of transmission is activation, or six. And then, of course, it has the common address for this set of ASDUs. That's how you'd put it together for a single command. I think it's really helpful to look through the spec and look at all the different ASDU types to see how they're put together and what information elements are included. It also includes the bits and bytes of how those ASDUs operate. It's probably worth noting that you probably don't need to know all of this information in order to send a request or in order to process a request if you're using the Triangle Microworks library. But this is what's allowed at the protocol level and what you'll see if you're actually looking at the bits on the wire. Because there's a lot of information here, you only need to look at it if you're looking at the bits or if you want to understand why there's a limitation. I should also point out that the information object here tells you which point you're going to be operating on. 
In DNP, you have index numbers or point numbers. The point numbers in DNP start at zero and go to N minus one for each data type. But for IEC 60870, every point in the system has to have a unique information object address or a unique common address plus the information object address. So this means control points and monitor points uh, don't have the same address. So it's important to note that in IEC 60870 is that every point has a unique address, unlike DNP, which the address is unique per data type. Also in 60870-5, the IOAs don't start at zero like they do in DNP. Um, and they can be whatever values you want, sequential or not sequential, it really doesn't matter. You can choose the values that you assign to these points. Um, also note that zero is generally illegal as a uh, information object address, uh, where it's typically the starting address in DNP. So you don't have to have point one, you could start at whatever number you arbitrarily choose or whatever number makes sense for the numbering scheme in your system. Okay, I think that about does it for the ASDUs. In the next video, we're gonna jump back into the application layer and look at that along with polling and controls.